But now we're going to talk about a completely new topic, and you don't, you don't, you can forget about yesterday. <laughs> well, not in time. Um, meanwhile, is there, is there still coffee, Mati? <laughs> <laughs> can you get me one? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we're going to talk about <coughs> uh, a recurrence quantification analysis. Um, this is a very powerful nonlinear time series analysis technique that has actually been. I think it's not it has not been developed by the climate scientists, but they uh, are, are the main developers currently, and, and, and they have uh, lots of uses for it. And um, uh, they, uh, especially the, the Climate Institute in Potsdam, in Germany, is doing a lot of uh, work on this. But it turns out that uh, uh, some uh, behavioral scientists, some cognitive scientists, uh, sort of independently also stumbled upon this technique. Uh, one of them is, for instance, uh, Rick Dale. I don't know if you read uh, his work. Uh, 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 and he used it especially for studying uh, synchronization behavior. And uh, I'll show you some examples of this. Um, and you can do it on uh, categorical data sets, which means you can have like behavior observations. Uh, and you can do it on continuous time series, which is where it was originally uh, developed. Um, so we'll start easy <laughs> and, uh, and do uh, categorical time series. But uh, well, the continuous uh, time series are also very interesting. So we'll talk about that later this afternoon. And, and we'll, st we'll start with auto-RQA, which means recurrence analysis of one time series. But there's also cross-RQA which you can use to study synchronization, and we'll talk about that as well in the afternoon. Okay, so, um, so maybe Mati can read this now. <laughs> <laughs> These are two uh, uh, stories written by Dutch kids. Um, and uh, they, they were presented with, a, um, with uh, pictures, and, and, and there were just pictures there, and they had to write a little story about what they thought was uh, was going on there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to translate. So now the goal is to figure out which of the, of the stories has a better quality. So yeah, which is qualitatively uh, better. Uh, so the first one is uh, Jort and Anne ask of Jan uh, if they can ride with the stroller. And uh, Jan says, yes, it's OK. And they uh, enter it. And they're riding very fast. And they see a tree. And then the stroller uh, breaks down. And then they, <laughs> they regain consciousness. <laughs> very imaginative. And then uh, Jan will, uh, uh, will repair the, the, the stroller again. OK, first one. And here we have. Uh, Daddy is sitting in a couch, and Daddy is working in the garden. And uh, he's fixing a, a, a car, a stroller, uh, and, and the kids. And probably of the kids. But uh, Daddy makes a stroller of the kids, and the kids, and the kids are against the tree. And the stroller is broken, and the kids are crying, and the kids are happy. <laughs> So, so what do you think? Which one is qualitatively better? The first or the second? First, the <coughs> second is a bit dead eyes. So why? Uh, why? <laughs> uh, repetition. Repetition, yeah. yeah. Contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you could do like, uh, yeah, yeah there, they make some, some grammar errors, or at least it's not very, very clear sometimes. But, uh, so yeah, so this is, a, this is a, actually from a real data set. Um, and, and these are maybe the most extreme uh, cases of quality difference, right? So this was a, this is a very high quality and <coughs> a very poor quality for kids of this uh, age. Um, but it turns out if you, if you take, uh, if you do a lot of these things and if you um, uh, try to figure out like a quantitative uh, measure which can, is able to distinguish between these things, um, uh, and you want you yeah you want to avoid a little bit like let's say uh, qualitative research where you have would have to have like deep opinion because you can have like I think this is from a PhD 
which had like hundreds of stories. <coughs> so so the, the ideal was to, to figure out whether there's kind of a, yeah, a, maybe an analysis or kind of a, a feature of these texts that does not require interpretation um, too much um, and to get to the quality. But you see, so mean long, length of utterance is, is usually kind of a, a thing used, but it's almost the same here. And the number of words is almost the same here, it's exactly the same. And it turns out that, <coughs> that if you have a large collection of these stories, um, you have kind of an okay inter <coughs> rate of reliability, but it's <coughs> it depends very highly on the experience of the, of the raters. So, uh, so if you ask students, you get a very low inter rate of reliability, and if you train them, then they get better, but it's still not very, um, very consistent. Um, um, but if you read these things, so like we just did, it's kind of obvious that you, yeah, you can see what's going on. So um, <clears throat> what I uh, did when I was a little bit involved in this project, I say, well, uh, you can think of these stories as time series, right? So every time uh, a word is uh, written that we have not seen before, you can just give a number to this word and then um, and then consider it as a time series. So one, two, three, four. So the first story we already noticed uh, did not have a lot of repetition. So here we can go up until 13. And then, then here for the first time, the word is actually repeated. All right, and then another word is used. And then it just goes up to 30. Here, for this story, you see that one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we are already repeating the word. And then the, the maximum number here is actually 19, and here it's 30. So the, the unique number of words here is, uh, is definitely something that, uh, that's different. Um, but even if you would take like the unique number of words, that will not uh, give you a, um, a good measure for quality, uh, because you can imagine that, that the order in which they arrive also uh, uh, means something. Uh, so you might, yeah, you might want to think about some some measure or measures that, that, that take actually both of those things into account. So how many things are repeated, or you might say recurring, right? Because we're talking about recurrence, quantification. Um, and, and if you would plot these, uh, uh, these time series, so they are nominal, uh, yeah, that's a Dutch E still there, but they are nominal time series or unordered categorical time series. Um, so they're, they're, the, the values here don't really mean anything. But you can see uh, this thing where you see where is the first uh, change, right? Uh, or the first uh, uh, repeat. Uh, and, uh, and, and also how high they get, for instance, is, is sort of indicative of, uh, of how many different words they use. Um, Another way to represent this is like this. So now here is the story. Here are all the words going uh, to the end of the story. And, and here we have a little dot. And uh, every time um, the word is repeated, we connect it to uh, the location of where it is actually repeated. So these arcs here, they are uh, signaling the fact that uh, that something is uh, going to be repeated, so n will be repeated, and the, uh, well, uh, all those things. And this is story one. Uh, so this, you, we will talk a little. I will talk a little bit about it um, uh, tomorrow morning. But this is actually uh, a network representation of this um, of the story, a graph representation, and it's called a recurrence graph. Um, so this is story one. Now let's look at story two. Yeah, lots more repetitions, right? And it's it, it appears to be not just more repetitions, but also you see there are these, these nodes here that receive lots of, uh, of, uh, of these connections, which means that they're repeated a lot. But they, they also appear to be repeating like in, in little groups. Okay. So uh, well, how do we quantify these things that we can see here? And uh, well, the answer is recurrence quantification analysis. And it's actually not that, 
that hard. Um, what you do is you take a matrix, you create a matrix. On the x-axis here we have a story and also on the y-axis. It's auto-recurrence quantification, so we have, we're looking at one uh, time series, so this matrix that we're going to build will be symmetrical here. And so this black line, the diagonal, is actually where we have like, uh, yeah, where the, where, the, where the words coincide, right? So that this would be like the, the, the line of ones in your correlation matrix, where, right, if you make a large correlation matrix. Um, okay, so what are we going to do? Well, you start here and you're, you look up, uh, and what, what are you doing when you're looking up? You're actually looking into the future, right? You're looking into the future of this story. And um, every time you see the same value recurring, which in this case is Jort, uh, you make a, make a, you, you can write a one or you can make the box black, whatever you like. Um, so, but Jort is not recurring. It's actually only mentioned once. Um, and is uh, recurring four times. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Uh, and then you can go on, Jan, three times, them four times, and you can go on and go on and fill out this uh, entire uh, um, matrix. So what we have now, if you fill, the, fill this out, um, this is now a symmetrical uh, matrix. Um, you can call it the recurrence matrix or the recurrence plot. And now we can actually do some quantifications, which are very simple, because it's just a question, a matter of uh, um, counting. Counting and, and, uh, and, and calculating proportions. So I'm not sure if I already changed it here, but so in, uh, in uh, our, we do a bachelor course uh, where we also do this with these stories and then the students have to make this matrix themselves. So I changed all the numbers <laughs> so that they're not, uh, so that they can't uh, uh, cheat. <laughs> but I think these are still correct. I think these are un unchanged, so this is still what it should be. But, um, so basically, um, each point is a repetition, if, it's, if you're talking about nominal uh, values, uh, of a category. In this case, it's a word, but it can be anything. It can be a behavior that you observed. It can be uh, anything that can be described as a category. Um, and um, um, the first thing you would do is quantify how many of these uh, repetitions are there, how many recurrent points are in this matrix. And uh, because it's symmetrical, you can decide, uh, listen, I'm going just to count on the upper one or the lower one, or afterwards I'm going to divide by, by, uh, by two or something like that. Um, and oh yeah, and, and one, one thing, we, we usually do not count the diagonal here, because that's just, you know, yeah. Uh, I, I, I have a question about the uh, um, framing framing of the research theme, yeah. how can we justify it? Do you always need to take all the stories that you're studying and all the words that have been mentioned and all the discussions in order to have a reliable setup or can you limit the uh, <coughs> y and x axis somehow in advance and if so, uh, how can you justify it? Yes, yeah, so um, the so, um, the measures you, you the measures you will the measures that come out of this are dependent on the length of the time series uh, very often so for example um, um, if you have longer time series I, there's more uh, uh, more chance that you uh, will have like a, a lower ratio of re recurrent points right so um, it depends a little bit on, on the type of thing that you're studying so it's always uh, and necessary to be very aware of the fact that when you want to compare this, so, so these were like 47 words long, but if you are going to compare this to uh, other stories that were like 200 words long, that's pro you need to do something to be able to do that, right? So you need to take those things into account. But here we have like, uh, uh, for this comparison, we have the same uh, length. 
Um, but you, you could, you could of course, uh, take those things into account and make, make, make these things relative to, to the length of the, uh, of the time series. Um, but otherwise, there is not really, also for the continuous uh, recurrence analyses, there isn't a lot of, uh, there aren't a lot of uh, uh, assumptions. It's just, yeah, well, you, things have to recur, because otherwise you have an empty thing. But then again, that's not really bad, because then all the measures will be zero, and you know nothing was recurring. Um, and uh, for the continuous time series, that, that's sort of also the, so there has to be a support in order to, uh, uh, for these things to, to work. <coughs> um, but that's about it. What do you mean support? Support means non-zero values. Yeah, there has to be sufficient. Yeah. Uh, with this uh, quantification analysis, I understand that it really depends on what we study. And for example, if we are talking about texts, uh, so uh, we are just for now looking for uh, reputation and we define yeah. the quality of the text based on that the reputation and. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, I was wondering, uh, so now with this quantification analysis, we are able to see the reputation, but not pattern, do we? Yes, we, we will be able to do this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And also, what, what sometimes happens is, um, especially this, has been, this is being used for text analysis, but also discourse analysis, um, conversations. Um, and uh, sometimes the unit is, yeah, you can choose the unit. So I could also have chosen letters, yeah, but that yeah, might not be very efficient. But you could also use the grammatical uh, category of the words, uh, semantic categories. Uh, lots of different uh, things are being used to, uh, to make these plots. And then also, make, yeah, sometimes they are compared. So how is the grammar the same as the underlying message? Or uh, but, but lots of variations are possible. But you, yeah, you're free to choose what you, you think is important to look at in terms of recurrences. Um, so, but the, 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 so we're not, we don't have patterns yet. So the first thing you can do is uh, is look at um, uh, how many recurring points are in this plot uh, compared to how many are possible. Well, how many would be possible? Now, if you think back about uh, well all the dates that I've been here. I've been talking about degrees of freedom that can be fixed or available. So, so this, this, the total number of recurrent points would be, the, would be something like the total number of uh, degrees of freedom that would be available uh, to, uh, to use. So in this case, you have something like 3.2% uh, recurrent points. Um, yeah, well, that's just, uh, that's one of the outcomes. Uh, for this story, we have 32 percent recurring points. So now we uh, can look at, at patterns as well. And how do we do this? Well, some of these points, not a lot of them, are lining up on diagonal lines, you see. So if, you, if your definition of a line is two, <laughs> then this would be a line. And you also have these lines, um, vertical or horizontal lines. In this case, their meaning is exactly the same, but we see with cross-recurrence analysis that there's actually a difference in the meaning. Um, so diagonal lines, um, this is the repetition of a pattern. And in this story, we have uh, the stroller, the wandelwagen, um, and, uh, uh, um, and it's recurring two times. So here we had the and wandelwagen, we look up, in the, into the future, and apparently here the appeared, but also Wandelwagen. And so this ends up as a, as a diagonal line structure, right? And it's, it's recurring two times. So in total, you have three patterns in this text, because here it is the first time, and then in the future it is recurring. Um, <clears throat> but of course, when these recurrences happen, you will again see this line structure, right? So there is a kind of redundancy here, but it's still uh, it's indicating that this pattern is, uh, is recurring. Now you can count how many recurring points are on diagonal lines. And this, indicate, this gives an indication of uh, uh, 
yeah, uh, the, the repetitiveness of, of some of these patterns. Um, so in this case, it's 11.4% of, of the points that are recurring are actually on a line, which means that they form uh, part of a larger pattern, of a larger recurring pattern. And this is what we call determinism. So um, you can imagine if you're talking maybe about some kind of physical system, uh, this would mean that it is repeating its behavior for some uh, extended period of time, and uh, which means it's not uh, a random system, but it's more like a deterministic system. And, uh, and this is expressed, expressed as a kind of uh, percentage. Now the vertical lines, they represent something else. Um, they do represent that something is repeating, and, and uh, if it's the line structure, also a, um, a pattern is repeating. And uh, it's, it's a repetition of exactly the same value, right? Because if you're... Uh, yeah. <coughs> so apparently here, uh, Jan is mentioned. And then we look up into the future, and then there, yeah, Jan is mentioned, but immediately afterwards, Jan is mentioned again. And it's actually, this is actually a little bit, uh, um, this is because a new sentence was uh, starting there, and then they used Jan again as the, as the first word. Um, but but this, is, this, is, this is telling you, okay, the stuff is repeating, but it's, uh, it's actually the same thing that is repeating. And um, if you think about, uh, the types of, uh, for instance, the types of attractors that we talked about a little bit uh, yesterday. Um, yeah, when a system ends up re repeating for a while the same thing, that's a kind of fixed point, right? So, so it's it's trapped in doing the same thing for a little while. In this case, it's not it's explainable why this happens, but yeah, the system might end up for uh, extended periods of time uh, be uh, yeah doing the same thing. So this we call laminarity. I don't know if you remember the picture of Humphrey Bogart with his cigarette smoke from yesterday. So we had this laminar face of the smoke where the smoke is going straight up in, uh, in a straight line and then it went into turbulence. Uh, well, this laminarity is, is uh, that's why it's called that way. It's, it's, yeah, every, the whole system is doing the, the same thing for a, a short period of time. So it's a little bit of a laminar face. And in this case, 5.7% of the points that are recurring are on a vertical line. Okay. So now let's compare the stories here. Uh, story 1 has a recurrence rate of 3.2%, and story 2 is indeed higher. Uh, the determinism in this story is 11, but here it's, it's uh, much higher. Almost half of the points that are recurring are actually also on a diagonal line, which means they are part of a pattern uh, that is uh, recurring at least once. So it's not just repetitiveness of individual words, but also repetitiveness of longer patterns uh, in this uh, story. Um, now, of course, <coughs> I can just say, uh, yeah, look, that's larger than this. Oh, oh, by the way, yeah, laminarity is zero, so there's no, uh, there are no vertical line structures here. Um, so that's a different, so maybe repetitiveness, usually the way you think about it, is actually doing the same thing maybe for some time. But in this case, this is a very repetitive story, but it's more about repetition of, of larger patterns than uh, doing the same thing. But that's, of course, because it's, it's, it's a story, it's a language, and then you would expect these kinds of things. Um, okay, so but how can we be a little bit more sure that, that this is actually larger than this here? Um, well, uh, one of the, the, the easiest things you can do is, uh, is uh, just shuffle the order and then calculate everything again. All right, so shuffle the order in which the words were uh, written down. And then uh, do uh, again this uh, this recurrence analysis, calculate everything, and let's see what happens. Well, one thing to notice: we're not adding new words, right? We're not uh, creating a new story or something like that. So the recurrence rate, the thing that is, the things that are recurring, will stay the same. 
If you shuffle it, that does, does not affect the recurrence rate. What of course will happen is, uh, uh, yeah, because you're destroying the correlations that are in this, uh, that, that might be in this, uh, in this time series, you're destroying the patterns uh, that determinism will likely drop if you randomize uh, your series. And in both cases, that actually is happening. Okay. Uh, laminarity. Um, uh, this, oh yeah, that's interesting. So uh, sometimes you, uh, especially if you are, are dealing with the nominal time series, um, of course this is a, like a limited set of values. Here we have words, which is kind of okay, but, but yeah, you can also do RQA just on, on uh, dichotomous time series, like 0, 1. Or, or, or very limited, like two or three categories. And then if you start to randomize, of course, what will happen is that by chance you can expect that, 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 that things will end up a little bit in a pattern or maybe even in, in uh, the same values will, uh, will occur uh, next to each other. So, so laminarity and determinism are, are a little bit, what, what you might expect, are a little bit dependent on uh, the, how many different categories are in your uh, time series. And here you see laminarity is not changing a lot. And here it goes from 0 to 22%, uh, which is, uh, yeah, this just happens by chance. But, but uh, 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 it's, it is expected here that, that it will not remain 0 after shuffling, uh, because this is actually uh, very unlikely with this uh, limited amount of, uh, of values that to have exactly 0 laminarity. Um, of course, I've done, now done this just once. But you could do this, the shuffling, like 99 times, for instance. Right? So do it 99 times, you get all these values. And then you add as the 100th value, <laughs> you add your observed value. You can make a nice distribution and, and look where is my observed value in this, in this distribution of random values. And if it's at one of the extremes of this distribution, you could actually calculate also a p-value for this and have an idea about how significant or maybe just uh, uh, how coincidental is it that I observed uh, my particular uh, uh, recurrence rate. So you can construct uh, um, these uh, kinds of uh, permutation tests, basically, uh, very easily. And, and, and imagine that you have that, you have then, uh, a statistical test for an individual. Yeah. Statistical, a permutation test for an individual. So you can, you're not, you're not using any group data, it's just the data that you observed for the individual. And just because you can uh, uh, generate, let's say, a surrogate time series, pretend, and what you're doing then is you're saying, let's pretend this was actually generated by a random process. That's what you're doing when you're shuffling this data. Um, uh, and that's actually a, a hypothesis test. So what you are doing when you're, when you're constructing a test like this, where you're just shuffling lots of times and adding your observed value somewhere in the distribution and considering its rank order, uh, you're actually testing, was my observed uh, time series uh, generated by the random process or not? And shuffling is, of course, the easiest thing you can do. I'll show you later on that there are more sophisticated ways. And, and also then different types of hypotheses that you could test by generating these uh, surrogate data. But, but that's actually it. This, so this is recurrence analysis. Uh, there are lots of measures, lots of other measures that you can extract from these graphs. But the basic idea is just you know, count how many times values are recurring decide whether they are on lines or whether they are, are on di diagonal lines or on vertical lines and then calculate these proportions. So other, other common values that you might want to calculate are for instance the mean line length. So mean diagonal line lengths give you an idea about uh, on average how long are repeated patterns. Max line length for diagonal, vertical, all those kinds of things. You have a question? Uh, how about if, if we have a, a lot of small sets of text about some kind of same topic, mm -hmm. can those somehow be combined yeah. and then done this? Yes. 
Yes. Do you put why? Like all all, 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 all in, a, in a same line or like yeah. a, like stack? No, there are a, there are a number of different techniques on how to do this. There is one technique which is called uh, joint recurrence plots, um, and there they just take like the matrix. They do just the matrix multiplication. And, and then you can add as many matrices as you like. And then you can generate also these uh, recurrent uh, plots. But you could also just take uh, averages or sum uh, each, uh, each um, square in the matrix. And those are called global recurrent plots. So then you get like, um, you, need, you do need then a kind of criterion for uh, the frequencies within a cell. So when, when do you still say that the group is repeating something, basically? You have to make a decision on that. But those things are, are done sometimes. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, I would say, yeah, why would you want to do this? Because, well, first of all, you could create these individual type of tests, so you're certain that what you observed is not just a fluke, right? But then if you want to compare groups, once you already know that, you can just put these things into your regular statistical text, uh, tests if you want to. Right? You can just compare, is the recurrence rate larger or smaller, using a t-test or non-parametric tests, whatever you like. That's, uh, that's all, um, all possible, of course. Um, does this somehow, or would you somehow relate this to information theory? Because when I look at and this is, I, I can think of like story two is much more redundant, and the first one has much more information. Yeah. Yes. So um, there is also yeah. If you would calculate the entropy of the time series, then you would definitely find this result. I think because uh, uh, the second story here would be uh, more predictable, so you would have a lower entropy. Interestingly, recurrence analysis also has an entropy measure. Um, yeah, so uh, on Monday when I talked about our experiment where we did this with the antisocial I don't know if you were there, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this, this entropy peak is actually the entropy from the recurrence analysis. And, but this entropy is, uh, if you make a distribution of the different line lengths that are in the plot, it's the entropy of this distribution. So if there are a lot of different uh, uh, line lengths, basically, uh, this is indicative of a system that's not really, really very stable because it's going from one deterministic uh, attractor to the other. And, uh, but if it's very uniform, it's very, very ordered. So <coughs> the entropy is sort of giving you information about uh, yeah, the, 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 the deterministic structure of the, of the attractor, which is what they would describe it. But there's a lot of um, uh, similarities, of course, uh, with, uh, yeah, you can also get information theoretic measures from these plots. Uh, yeah, you, you can consider these things as zeros and ones. Yeah. Um, so sometimes uh, when I discuss these things with people, they say that, okay, so these methods have been um, developed for these uh, very, uh, ideal systems and uh, so when we do those analysis with like real systems and noisy systems uh, um, uh, what happens then and uh, you told uh, one person on Twitter that uh, yeah, you can study the effects of uh, noise uh, yeah so can you operate on that so what happens if you have a very noisy system yeah maybe that's better if we do if you're talking about the continuous version mm. because here what would the noise here be? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but another thing is, uh, I, I also always think that that's a kind of odd comment, and it's true that people make these comments. I don't know if someone is spreading these <laughs> this disinformation. I don't know. No, but but uh, uh, especially uh, the, the cross recurrence. I mean, the the the, the papers that were. The, the titles of the papers where, where the first these uh, techniques were described are, you know, detecting synchronous, detecting coupling in extremely noisy situations, and they show that that that, that these techniques are, are exceptionally good, uh, have an exceptionally good performance in exceptionally noisy situations. So, I don't know where that idea is coming from. 
Uh, maybe it's it's because uh, usually it's it's coming from statisticians, so who, who are, don't have like a physics background, but they they are then concerned about uh, um, about these things. I think I have some slides on. Uh, yeah, they will they will I will they, I will talk about this a little bit later. But for instance, um, well, uh, the, this has been used also to, to analyze like uh, fMRI data and those kind of things. And then the RQA-based methods they they outperform all the traditional stuff. So it's um, it's it's actually exceptionally good at, uh, at in noisy situations. Yeah. Okay, can you apply this method to rhetorical analysis? So are there better tools for that? Can you, for, for example, use it to, to detect hidden alliances or agendas? Anything that you can translate into a time series of categories. So if you are interested in, uh, in, in, in a con if someone has a conversation and, and they, uh, uh, or maybe a monologue, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you can so, sort of code the, what they are saying into the thing that you're interested in, and this can be a time series, then you can, can do this. Yeah. So there are many examples of this in uh, um, by uh, yeah, Rick Dale, I think, has done most work on this. Rick Dale, uh, R R I C K D P A L E. So he started out doing this by analyzing conversations between kids and their parents, but on many different levels. So not just on word level, but also semantic structure. All those kind of yeah. I can give you another example. Um, so this is uh, oh yeah, it's also a Dutch title. Um, this is uh, a study that uh, we did um, uh, using uh, the. Uh, this is a kind of a neuropsychological test called the random number generation, and. Um, it's, uh, it's suppo supposed to measure something that is called executive control. Uh, I, I didn't know what the, this was before I started the study, and I still don't know, and I, I don't know if it means anything, but well, that's what they say. Um, and the, and the, the assignment is, as you see this uh, number pad, and then uh, uh, yeah, generate random numbers, random number sequences, and then in the instruction you have to explain a little bit what that means, because not a lot of people are actually aware. You, you have to say it is possible in a random number sequence for two numbers to appear, uh, for two of the same numbers to appear after one another. And sequences are possible and all those kinds of things. You have to really explain a little bit about what that means. And then um, yeah, people just uh, generate a uh, time series of these random numbers. In this case, for this, this study, um, we had, um, uh, I think there were 100, 100 time series of 100 random numbers. So what we wanted to do, and, and the way these things are analyzed is very much, um, let's say, based on, uh, on probability. probability. So if, if um, uh, these number sequences deviate from some uniform distribution. Uh, they, they've, they've invented all kinds of measures that, 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 that are looking into, they are trying to quantify also uh, yeah, how random um, uh, these number sequences are. Uh, and they also try to, they have all kinds of measures about uh, whether there are patterns in the data and very well difficult computations. We, we, are, we, we have turned the original measures also into an R package, which will be uh, uh, publishing very soon, but, um, but uh, it was very difficult to, uh, to uh, understand what they were doing from the paper. So in the end, we, we, we were sent like a, uh, a very old visual basic code for a, for a piece of software <laughs> that is doing these calculations, and we had to translate it into R. But, but anyway, we succeeded, but I still do not understand all about those measures. It's, it's very... Uh, it has, has to do with, uh, with probability, it's not my strong point. Um, so this, these are two examples of uh, random number se uh, sequences. Uh, and you can see here uh, the time series and, and here as well. 
And um, you might think that, that this is uh, something that we generated, but this is actually a participant. And um, uh, at the summer school, we could not lo localize him, but I think uh, Wouter found, found him or her. Um, because this, of course, you can see there are almost no uh, line structures here, right? So this person uh, looks like they were very uh, good at, uh, at at least not repeating themselves. So the recurrent, the number of recurrent points here is uh, is ten uh, percent, which makes sort of sense. Uh, so there are one hundred numbers, and you had zero to nine. So so th this, is, this is sort of recycling uh, exactly uh, every number. Um, in, in 100 steps, uh, just uh, uh, and, and no no, rep, no excessive repetition or uh, of, of uh, single numbers. Uh, determinism here is 18 percent, and then you have these uh, other values. So this would be uh, the laminarity, um, and then the, the length of the line lengths, uh, the, uh, line lengths. Oh, here's laminarity, and uh, the maximum line lengths, and and they are zero or very short. This is a more common thing you see when you ask people to generate these random numbers. Determinism, uh, our recurrence rate is actually no, not, not very much higher, but a little bit. But the determinism, 65%, right? So people will, um, in the end, uh, create some uh, uh, recurring patterns here. Um, laminarity, 80%, 82%. So this person is also repeating things in sequence. Okay, so uh, we uh, of course have to do some uh, surrogate testing to, to figure out well, how, um, how interesting this is or how random these people were. That was the point of the paper. We thought RQA uh, should be much better at uh, distinguishing how well these people performed on their random number sequence than uh, compared to these uh, traditional measures that they uh, calculated. So you can see here almost nothing changes, right? So this is this person, uh, this is after randomization. Um, what we can say, and the most significant thing that changed here, is actually, again, this, so this, this person had laminarity zero, which means none of the sequences, none of the numbers were, were repeated after one another in time. And, and this is actually an indication still that this is not a random number <laughs> series, because you would expect, based on chance, to have at least some of these values uh, repeat. So after uh, reshuffling, you have 50% uh, um, laminarity here. Um, and in this case, you see that uh, especially determinism and laminarity uh, drop uh, considerably. Uh, also, the, the, the max line rates and the mean line rates, they drop. Absolutely. And again, you can do this, of course, a number of times to, um, to get a kind of... Uh, yeah, you can also use these, these repetitions with, with shuffling to get maybe a kind of uh, confidence bound or something around, around your uh, null hypothesis values. And, and then figure out if they are outside these bounds. Yeah, that's the same as doing a test, of course, uh, in this case. So, um, we had a lot of these uh, time series. And... Um, This was almost the same. I wanted to go to this one, um, and uh, we did a, we did a um, uh, uh, so previous studies had done like uh, like factor analyses and, and uh, principal components, which is actually not what you should do. But anyway, they did it, uh, and, uh, and and so what you see here are the um, are the classical measures, so redundancy and, and RNG2 and all kinds of things that they calculate. Um, and, uh, and here we have the RQA measures. And so what they figured originally was uh, that there are like four components, updating, a very cognitivist uh, uh, factors here, inhibition and output inhibition, uh, and something that's undefined. <laughs> um, and, um, and so uh, in, in two studies we, uh, we, we replicated it, and, and then, but then entered the, um, the RQA measures, like the diagonal lengths and the uh, and laminarity, recurrence rate, and then you end up with just two uh, 
two factors actually, and our interpretation here was, uh, um, yeah, uh, people are probably uh, concerned about not repeating too much and um, uh, uh, not, not repeating patterns and not repeating um, the same value because laminarity ends up, I think, in a different uh, spot than all the diagonal measures. So, so actually, in our factor analysis, you have this. Uh, uh, distinction between whether they are making diagonal lines or whether they are making uh, vertical lines. So that's an example of, uh, you know, the, 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 it's, a, it's an unordered categorical time series. The numbers don't mean anything, the order of the numbers. Um, and RQA uh, is able to, uh, to uh, well, apparently distinguish uh, a little bit better than the original measures here, um, something that is random from something that is generated by a human. Um, yeah, so that's categorical recurrence analysis. Um, and we have some uh, assignments to do. Uh, of course, after we have some coffee.